flooding. This is the crux of the problem. A natural river system will periodically flood. Okay, that's how that's part of the cycle that the river goes through. As the river moves around on a floodplain, the reason it's called a floodplain, as it moves around on the floodplain, periodically it needs to overflow its banks and dump sediment on the sides of the floodplain. That's a natural process. So much of the year the river's going down its channel quite happily. Once a year, every few years, you have a major flooding event where the river overflows its banks, and when it overflows its banks and floods over a large area, it suddenly dumps a lot of sediment over the surrounding area. Okay? So flooding, of course, if you've built on that uh, um, surrounding area or if you're farming on that surrounding area, you don't want it to flood. Of course, it causes major damage. However, as soon as you stop it from flooding, you have in some way changed the natural cycle, the natural balance of the river system. Okay? So flooding, of course, is, you know, the, is a problem. It would flood people's homes, flood people's farms. And and so people want to stop it. And so uh, back in 1880s, Congress established the Mississippi River Commission. Okay, that was the beginnings of starting to try and engineer uh, the river system. This was then taken over um, by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And still today, they are responsible for maintaining river levees, um, including those along the Mississippi and including those that surround uh, New Orleans. And so there's a very long history of engineering our rivers uh, in the U.S. Um, to try and prevent these annual or semi-annual um, flooding type of events. Now, what happens as a result of this? Okay? As a result of what, you, what happens when you build a levee is you put a nice solid wall down the two banks of the river, and you build a levee up high so that in these flooding events now, this, the water does not overflow the banks and flood. It stays within this channel. Okay? The catch with that is that now what you've just done is you've cut off the supply of sediment to the surrounding areas. So before you put the levees in, every year you'd have a big flooding event, and that, that big flooding event, of course, is the biggest storm of the year. It's the storm that carries the most sediment down the river of the entire year. And when you have the flood, you have a fast-running river that carries sediment. The faster the water is traveling, the larger the grains of sediment that can be carried. It overflows the banks, and as soon as it overflows the banks, it stops. The velocity of the water drops to near zero. And as soon as the velocity of the water drops to near zero, all of the just drops out of the water. So what it's doing is it's transporting the bulk of the sediment down the river and dumping it on the sides of the river during this mass flooding event. Okay? So a normal river will be adding layers of sediment to the entire floodplain, right, so the floodplain to the entire floodplain on an annual basis or every few years. Okay? It's a continual process. Now what happens when you do that is that you're building up the layers of sediment. And believe it or not, the mass of sediment in these deltas, these delta systems, these big piles of sediment, it is so heavy that it actually pushes down on the surface of the earth. Okay? So this big thick pile of sediment that's been built up by these big river deltas is so heavy the surface of the earth is actually pushed down. The earth's crust flexes a little bit, it pushes it down, and so of course it subsides a little bit, and then the next year you get another flood, and you, you reach this natural balance whereby you're providing more sediment. The, the delta is, is subsiding, you add more sediment, and you're in some sort of natural equilibrium that you achieve. Now you build your levee. Now you stop supplying sediment to that floodplain on an annual basis or every few years. Okay? And instead you are just channeling all of that sediment all the way down the river. And so that's why this bird's foot delta, as it's called, has been created by virtue of the fact that we have been engineering the Mississippi River since the 1880s. Okay? And so you can see sort of the edge of, of the, this, this area here is um, land surface that is subsiding. Okay? And so in some places you just see water, in some places you see plots of land. And this is the edge of, of where the land surface used to be. And now you see this big strong um, delta. This is the delta getting further and further out. So the river gets further out, the levee is extended, and they're just basically project, you know, continuing to push the river further and further um, out uh, into, the, um, into the ocean here, and you're getting this extended delta. And because you're not providing any more sediment here, it's continuing to subside, and you're flooding the land surface. This is not Katrina. This is just every single day. All right? So the delta is sinking due to the fact that there is, um, there is no, um, there's no new supply of sediment. And so 100,000, sorry, 1,000 square miles of Louisiana um, has subsided beneath the, um, the Gulf of Mexico, the sea surface of the Gulf of Mexico, over the course of the last 50 years. Okay? So we've actually engineered this problem ourselves. Don't get me wrong, there was a good reason for doing it. It was to prevent flooding all along the Mississippi. But the fact that the land surface is still subsiding, the fact that we're losing land surface, is entirely our own doing. Any questions about this sort of concept, this principle? Uh -huh. So and, unfortunately, as you know, I wasn't here on Thursday. I'm not sure quite how far William got through, but our own delta um, that's uh, immediately east of San Pablo Bay um, indeed is below sea level. And um, I'm gonna, well, it's, I don't know, how many people here have actually driven out onto one of the little roads that crosses the delta? Not very many of you. Okay, great weekend activity. Okay, you can drive. I'm not sure how far it is. I take students on field trips out there. Maybe an hour's drive from where we are right now. Go into the middle of the delta and go along where, the, where one of the river channels is, and you park next to the river, and you can see the river surface, and you look down, and the, all of this all farmland. The farmland is about five meters below the river level. So our own California delta has exactly the same problem. And so that's why the scary scenario um, for a big earthquake in the Bay Area is that if you, if you damage those levees, seawater from the bay will flood the delta. The entire delta will become salt water, and that has implications for the Southern California's water system. I'm guessing William covered that. Where is William? Did you cover that? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So it's the same problem. Exactly right. And it's exactly the same issue that people started to build levees to keep the, the flow confined to the channel. You don't dump any more sediment. The delta continues to subside. They have to continue building the levees up. And now you have this crazy situation where the surface of the river, the river level, is five meters above land surface. It's stunning. Really encourage you all to go out and see the delta. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> is there a way to solve this problem? Any suggestions? Uh oh. There's no obvious way to solve the problem, right? So there are fixes, um, and so one of the things that the water bond measure that's on the ballot this fall is intended to do is to build a peripheral canal um, so that you, if you do flood the delta, you don't destroy Southern California's water supply. Um, and then the other solution, of course, is to just remove the, remove the levees. Okay? And over a period of time, the delta will then build up with sediment again, and you get your land surface back. But you know, that's, not a practical, that's not a solution that's going to happen, because to do that, you have to destroy a huge area of land. Somebody owns that land. And so that's where the rub comes. Yeah. So I'm going to do my, the question was, before we started building the levees, how far out did the delta go? I'm going to give you my best guess. I don't know the answer. But my guess is that this little line here that you can see, and the reason that that's there is because that was the original um, edge of uh, Louisiana. So my guess is that the, how far Louisiana extended out would have been around, around about here. And so that means that all of this piece has kind of been added on by this process. But this is my best guess based on the geomorphology we can see in this picture. OK, any other questions? Yeah. Um, I forget the sediment, but um, how much would it cost to build the, um, the peripheral canal? The question is, how much would it cost to build the peripheral canal? I have no idea. I'm sure that number's out there. Somebody can figure it, can it up maybe and come back and report to us. Maybe you could report back to us on Thursday. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to keep going, I think. All right, so, so that's the background. 
That's how we created this disaster ourselves. And so now let's sort of start looking at this in a little more detail. So here's this map. I included this just to show you where New Orleans is exactly on this sort of bigger picture. So it's right here between the Mississippi River and between the, and the lake. Okay? And here's a cross-section. I love this figure. So this is a cross-section that's going from A to B on this map A to B on this map A to B. Okay? And so this is obviously a satellite image. This is the river here meandering around. Okay? This is the lake up here. And then all of this gray stuff is, of course, the urban environment. Okay? And so, so this cross-section is just going from here to here. And you can see that the entire cross-section is below the mean. This shows the mean uh, uh, water level. Oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. This was the level on a particular day during Hurricane Katrina. Um, you can see here it says the average annual high water on this side. This is the Mississippi River side. Okay, so this is the average annual high water of the Mississippi River. It's basically right at the peak of the bank, and then the levee goes above it at the flood stage. And then over here, this is the normal lake height here. You can see the normal lake height is, in fact, at this point, a little bit above where the bank is, and then the levee obviously extends even further. All right? So this is the normal lake level. This is the average high water. Okay? The entirety of the, this section of the city is essentially below one of those two levels. So that's why people call New Orleans a city in a bowl. Is that right? I guess it's not. They talk about it being a city in a bowl because it is literally on land surface that is below typical sea levels, typical water levels. Never mind about a catastrophic event like this hurricane. Okay? So it's only a matter of time until one of these levees fails and you have the kind of flood event um, uh, that we obviously saw. Uh, here's a map that shows the, um, the elevation of the land surface. And this comes back to the question about the uh, different parts of New Orleans and the social and economic, or the imbalance in the impact on different uh, social economic sectors of society from this hurricane. So the, basically the cool colors, the sort of blues and sort of purple colors, um, are, cool shades are below the normal level of the lake. All right? And then these warm colors that you can see actually around the river are above the normal level of the lake. All right? But still below the normal level of the river. Okay? Again, this comes to the fact that the river levees have been built up and the river continues to kind of raise up. Well, not sorry, the land surface subsides, giving the appearance that the river is raised up. But this is the old parts. This sort of portion along the river are the old parts. This is the Superdome. This is the downtown area, central business district. And these are the older parts of the city. And the point is that the older parts of the city were, of course, built on the high land surface. Right? When, you first, when people first settled here, they didn't build on the low level, low parts, because they would see it flooding on a, on a regular basis. And then as time has progressed and the city built out, it would gradually build on um, land surface that was at lower and lower elevations. And in particular, the ninth ward up here um, is an area that's particularly low. And, and so this is where the socioeconomic piece comes in. But it's true that the poorer parts of the city tend to be these areas. They tend to be the areas that were built last. Um, and they're the areas that are furthest away from the downtown area. And so they are lower elevations, um, and they tend to be the poorer parts of the city. And those are the parts that were worst hit. That's true. OK. Um, and then this is the levee system um, and the area that was flooded. So, so again, this is the, the lake here. This is the river, so the, the levees around the river. But this is just to illustrate that the levee system is this hugely complicated system. It's not just a levee along the margin of the lake and then two levees on either side of the river. There's this system of levees throughout out the city. Okay? And so this sort of cascading failure that occurred in Hurricane Katrina is that one set started to fail and flooded one area and then another one failed and gradually the flooding expanded through, um, you know, through much larger parts of the city. So this is the ninth ward up here, downtown area right here. Um, and so the images that you see are often of this, you know, this area completely flooded, this area completely flooded, looking towards the skyscrapers of the downtown area in the background. So you're looking either here or you're looking here. Okay? Okay, so this is the hurricane um, approaching, um, and so again, this is the eye of the storm. Um, this, this is the intensity, the color here is the intensity of the storm, and so you can see that there are these bands associated with the vorticity of the hurricane, and it's, it's when this piece hits um, that most of the damage was done, that most of the, of the flooding occurred. It's difficult to see where New Orleans is. I think it's, uh, I can't see here, but I think it's, it's right about here. Um, but anyway, so that's the hurricane. It was, it was a direct hit to the city. There's no question about that. Um, okay, but again, this should not be a surprise to anybody. These are hurricanes, um, significant hurricanes, only category three and higher. Okay, that essentially uh, were either hit or were very close uh, to New Orleans. And it happens on a remarkably regular occurrence. You saw that in the map that I showed you just for the last five years or so of hurricanes. Um, and so this is, this is a common event. It happens regularly. And yet that's why they have all the levees. And yet still, it turns out the levees weren't quite good enough. So some of the highlights in terms of past destruction along the Mississippi River, 1927 um, flood. Uh, the death toll for that is unknown. It remains unknown. It's in the thousands. Okay? Um, and this was flooding along much of the Mississippi River. Um, a million homeless, almost a million fed by the Red Cross for, for months, in some cases for a year. So again, this is, these events are recurring events. Of course, you know, this is back in 1927, so people don't remember it, obviously, and people just think that this is some past event and this wouldn't happen today. It could happen today. Following all of the legislation for these kinds of uh, hazards, immediately followed big events. And sure enough, in 1928, there was the Flood Control Act, um, and so that was when the federal government took over responsibility um, for flood, flood management. That's essentially when the Army Corps of Engineers took over responsibility for the levees. Uh, 1957, a uh, 12-foot storm surge, death toll of 500, 40,000 people um, were left homeless. Hurricane Audrey, this was, this was considered to be one of the more damaging events um, until, until this one, 1965, Hurricane Betsy. Um, you know, pictures that are not that different to what we saw in Hurricane Katrina. And so, of course, what's the conclusion? Higher levees. Let's build the levees higher. Um, and obviously that worked for a number of years. Um, and then 2005, um, Hurricane Katrina. This is the Superdome, um, which is the stadium that was used as a shelter by more than 10,000 people. Um, but you can see that this, you know, it's raised up, but you can see it was completely surrounded by water. So even getting to the Superdome was a real challenge, and that's why it was such a challenge to then get people out of the Superdome. And in the end, they just resorted to a... Um, I don't know what the flotilla of helicopters. <laughs> I don't know what the term is. Yeah, question. Do that again. How many feet higher the levees? Let me get back quickly to that cross section because that shows um, the height of the levees at these particular uh, points. Okay, so this levee here is 17.5 feet high. Um, over here is 23, 23 feet high. These are substantial uh, engineered structures, and of course, you know they go on for miles and miles and miles around the city. The, the issue here is that you build a levee, and people think they're protected, and so they then build behind the levee, right? And so it's sort of unfortunately it's a, a self-propagating problem. Okay. Um, so what were the costs? What were the impacts of Hurricane Katrina? About 1,500 people were killed um, by the storm. Total estimated economic loss, $135 billion. Insured losses estimated to be between 20 and $35 billion. Okay? So that means it's kind of like $100 billion that was not insured. That means that somebody had to pay for it, not the insurance company. Right? Most people's homes were not insured. And if you're a homeowner, that means it's your responsibility to rebuild your home. Nobody's going to come and rebuild your home for you. Right? So now not only do you have to
So this is one of the issues when it comes to uh, catastrophes like these natural hazards, is that typical insurance does not cover damage due to these kinds of events. And so people are left holding the, uh, um, the bill themselves. Uh, here's some of the most costly catastrophes. This is, of course, prior to Hurricane um, Katrina. Hurricane Andrew back in 1992, $20 billion. Um, the World Trade Center, the terrorist attacks, $20 billion. Northridge earthquake, $15 billion. Um, hurricanes, more hurricanes. Yeah, all the rest are, are smaller hurricanes. Yeah, so we just jumped from a $20 billion um, cost to $135 billion. The co estimated cost of the Tohokuoki earthquake is more than $100 billion as well. So that's the kind of cost when people estimate the cost we expect for a magnitude 7 earthquake on the Hayward Fault. It's at the $100 to $200 billion kind of level. So major uh, cost. Now, when you take that and you analyze it, this is an old study now, um, done back in, what's the date, 1998. This is actually a study that I was part of. But we went back and we estimated the total costs due to these various uh, hazards, and you analyze the costs. The total cost of natural disasters in the U.S. averages out to be about a billion dollars per week. Okay? Of course, this comes in these big chunks, $135 billion, but it's a billion dollars a week. So this, this is a major um, uh, cost in the U.S. that many, many people, including myself, will argue we spend very little money trying to reduce the future impacts of these, of these events. So what about the recovery? Um, oh, I have two slides, sorry. This is the one I wanted to show you. Yeah, question. So the question was, does the $1 billion a week include refurbishing buildings? No, the $1 billion is the cost from events. So that's just taking the costs of past events. This was done in 1998, and then we'll probably be higher at this point. But the cost of past events, so $135 in the case of Hurricane Katrina, adding them all up and then averaging them um, per year. That's all. So it doesn't, there's nothing built into that about retrofitting buildings so that you reduce the future. It's just the raw costs right now. Okay. All right, so what about recovery? I asked you uh, last week about what does it take to destroy their city? What does it mean to destroy a city? You've seen um, the impact of the infrastructure in New Orleans. This is sort of the recovery. Um, this is, so this is what I was saying at the time of the hurricane. I guess it was a little less than, it was about 450,000 people with the population. New Orleans is uh, in yellow here. And then this is what happened to the population. It basically dropped down to less than 50% in the immediate aftermath and has been gradually climbing up since. And so the latest numbers out of last year actually has us back up at about 80%. Okay? So the population in New Orleans is still 20% less than it was um, prior uh, to Hurricane Katrina. And so the recovery is ongoing. And then another figure that I think is really interesting, uh, William found this one for me. This, so this is the map I showed you earlier of the, uh, the elevation, which of course corresponds to how much flooding there was. This is the percentage of June 2005 residential addresses that were actively receiving mail in June uh, 2014. Okay? So this is how many homes, this is the, the uh, percentage of homes that were active, they had, were getting mail, compared to what it is now. Right? When it's 100%, then it's, it's this you know, strong green. And this whole region here, for example, around the river, this is the area um, that did not flood, for the most part. The area that's relatively high, of course, is all at 100%. And then you go over here to the ninth ward, where there was a lot of damage. And now, you know, this orange here is between 50 and 75%. The yellow is 75 to 90%. So you can see the distribution here, this is in that form, what happened to the population. Okay? So the regions that were hardest hit, the regions that were lowest, still their population is not recovered. The regions that were least affected are largely unchanged. Okay, so the recovery is still ongoing. Okay, so lessons to take away from, um, from this. Most natural disasters were predicted. Okay? Hurricane, Pre Hurricane Katrina was not a surprise. When we have an earthquake on the Hayward Fault, it will not be a surprise. Okay? There will be people in the news, they'll be shocked, and they'll be talking about how horrendous this is, and they can't believe this has happened. We know it's going to happen. That's what I mean by most natural disasters were predicted. Their infrequency results in low priority or neglect of mitigation strategies. There's basically a correlation. The more frequently you have some sort of disaster, the more we're likely to invest on reducing its impact. Best case example is winter. So of course, most of you are Californians. You don't really have winter in California. But those of you who know what winter is will know that you also take measures to protect yourself. Okay? So I grew up in the UK. The winter is horrible. So we all live in houses. We all have central heating systems. Okay? So we take actions to protect ourselves against that hazard. So we don't think of winter as being a hazard because we've taken actions to reduce the impact of winter. Okay? That comes around every single year, and so we've done something about it. Major uh, hurricanes like this come around every few years. Major earthquakes come around every few decades. And so that's the challenge, the infrequency of events. Help can be many days in arriving. You'll, you'll, we're going to cover this uh, um, actually on Thursday, I think, when we talk about earthquake preparedness. Um, people tell you to be ready for three days. Hurricane Katrina, it was five days. You have to be ready to look after yourself for a surprising, surprisingly long period of time. Individuals and communities must be able to survive by themselves for up to a week, so I just said. Um, the disruption to lives can last months. Really, it's years. Hurricane, um, New Orleans, of course, still hasn't recovered. So the impact on people, if we had an earthquake here, um, the impact on people would last years. Many of you, so if we had an earthquake here, UC Berkeley would probably close down. Many of you would probably end up transferring to other colleges. You wouldn't get your Berkeley education. That would be catastrophic. <laughs> Um, the cost to the country is greater than a billion dollars per week. So this is a major, um, major economic loss, a major economic factor. Um, but still, it's a challenge to deal with it because we don't lose a billion dollars every week. We lose a few hundred billion dollars every few decades. All right. Thank you very much. See you on Thursday.